Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Today, President Trump signed a pair of executive orders fulfilling his pledge to implement what he called extreme vetting for arrivals from dangerous nations, mostly in the Middle East. The order blocks Syrian refugees from entering the country until a stronger vetting process can be implemented. The orders also suspend all refugee arrivals for a period of the next three months and cap total refugees at 50,000 for this year. That's less than half of the previous limit. The orders are already being labeled a Muslim ban by critics who say they won't actually make this country any safer. One of those critics is Kevin Appleby. He's director of migration policy at the Center for Migration Studies of New York, and he joins us on the set. Kevin, it's good to see you tonight. Thanks for having me. So I think the kind of core question around the entire refugee issue is, why does bringing in refugees from places like Syria benefit American citizens? What's in it for America? Well, first of all, it, it's, it's soft power. The U.S. has soft power. They're able to help other countries who share the burden of the refugees. And in that way, they're able to negotiate other issues with them in, 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 that they're interested in, that we, they're in our vital interest. It's also a humanitarian gesture. I mean, we're a nation of immigrants. We have, we're a nation of safe haven. A lot of these Syrians are fleeing terror themselves. Yes. They're very vulnerable. Mostly women and children are coming here. They're not threats. And they go through more security checks than any arrival to this country. It's usually a two- to three-year process for one Syrian to get into right. this country. So they, they're very well vetted. They're not security risks. Um, it's, I, I don't understand why the president is, is banning them from coming in, because we need to provide support to this situation. Okay. I mean, I don't think anybody doubts that, that a lot of these are decent people fleeing the worst possible circumstances. But I want to get back to a question that I think it's fair to ask, and I just want to flesh out your answer a little bit more. What is in it for American citizens? It's also fair to ask, why should we pay for this? And there is some risk. There's always going to be some risk. Mm -hmm. Why should we assume that risk? You said it's because... Other countries like it when we do it, I think, is what you said. No. What do we get out of that? Let's talk security. I would argue it makes us more secure than less secure, because what ISIS and other extremist groups want is exactly what the president gave them today, a war between the West and, and Islam. It's a recruiting tool for them. Yeah, the president's now a poster child for ISIS to recruit Muslims all over the world, including our own country, and to radicalize them. Look, the United States doesn't like you. They don't like Islam. You have to come to our cause. So now this ISIS plays, is... That plays into their hands, and, and it really makes us le less safe over the long term. And if you ask any security expert, they'll say the same thing. Well, I don't think we have a security expert available to vouch for that right now, but I just want to get to the logic behind it. You're saying that now ISIS is really going to dislike us, and they're really going to say mean things about us. So unless we let in people from Syria... They're going to hate us? Don't it's, they already hate us? It's not, just, it's not just about Syria. It's about all the Muslim countries that the president is banning. But don't they from. already? I mean, it's, their case is looked been... upon as an attack on Islam, not just on Syrians. But aren't, isn't, I mean, I can say this definitively ISIS has been making that case since its origination. I mean, since they began and Al Qaeda before them and various radical Muslim groups in the Middle East before them. They've mm -hmm. always said this is a religious war and that we hate Islam. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds to me like you're blaming the United States and our policy for their distorted view of the United States. No, no. What I'm saying is, what's the best policy in the long term to keep us safe? And, and keeping Syrian refugees out of this country, who are well vetted and are very vulnerable, is not the best method, but because it plays into their hands. It gives them another tool to radicalize someone here in this country. I mean, the attacks on this country have been from people that have been here Right. and have been radicalized. This allows them to use social media, look what the president's doing here, they hate you, and it creates fear among the Muslim community. But, 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 the other thing is... Wait, Tucker, wait, wait, wait thing, hold on, before Tucker, you get the other thing, let me just, let's get to the first thing, you just said something I want to respond. So you're saying that people in this, you're conceding that refugees and children of refugees in this country, because it's factually true, have already committed acts of terror against Americans. Not true. Well, the Zarnayevs? I'm sorry? The Zarnayev brothers? Well, they didn't technically come through the refugee program. Okay, but they were, in, in effect, refugees from another country brought here at public expense. They became radicalized and killed a bunch of Americans. Right, but others had been radicalized weren't refugees. I mean, the Well, many were the know. children of refugees, as you know. Well, I mean, we've, not, in Minnesota, there have been a number of terror were plots. Born, for, but no, some of they, them were American born, they, but their parents were brought here as refugees. Well, well not. We can dispute the facts. No, actually, we can't. Those are the facts. No, they, they didn't come through the refugee program itself. But look, you're basically they, saying there, there are different ways to come that we have country. to let more people in, or else we'll be hated more by Islamic extremists. Is that? Is, I mean, I think that's your point. Well, what I'm saying is, it's in our interest to resettle a certain number of refugees 
in order, first of all, to show global leadership, but also to have leverage over other countries so that they'll do the same thing. Otherwise, the world is chaos. And it, it improves our relations with those countries so that if we want something else from them, we can get it. Here's what I'm a little confused by. There's a moral component in this. And yeah. a lot of the refugees who come to this country, you said it's our duty, basically. And a lot of them are Christian organizations, and I support those organizations. But in case after case, these groups, and the Conference of Bishops, I think, is one, Lutheran Social Services is another, Christian groups who bring these refugees into America, help them resettle here, and then offload the cost on taxpayers. How is that consistent with a person's Christian duty? Why are you doing your Christian duty if you're forcing other people to pay for a good work like that? Well, it is a government-private partnership, private-public partnership with these organizations. And yes, taxpayer money, money pays for the resettlement of refugees. But churches contribute to this. It's, it's not just solely pay for the tax. Okay, pay. but but, but, it but is, why wouldn't it is but truly hold, a partnership? Okay, but it's not but, really a partnership. It's not a voluntary partnership. I don't support it. I'm required to pay for it. So are hundreds of millions of other Americans. Well, there are a lot and of things churches, who are required to pay for. Of course, but churches say this is our duty as Christians. Yeah. If it's your duty as a Christian, why aren't you paying for it yourself? Well, a lot of a lot of people are. We really, name, lot... name a Christian resettlement group. It brings, all the, all, helps bring refugees in and actually absorbs the full cost. There isn't one. Not the full cost, but they contribute so how is costs that? from their parishioners and others who want to help these people, not only in money, but in time and well, energy. But, but, but I don't understand. I mean, how, how can you claim you're being virtuous if you're forcing someone else to pay for it? If I rob you at gunpoint, of course you they, well, they, they, are. Are. they do it on their no, own. No, because you're using government money taken by force from taxpayers to finance something you think is virtuous. Well, you can say that about a lot of issues. Yeah, but you know? you're making a moral claim to it. You're saying we're good people, we want to do good works, and my question is then why, why wouldn't you pay for those works? If I rob you at gunpoint and take that money and put it in a collection plate, I don't get credit from God from that, do I? I guess we'll all find out, but... Um, no, but it's a sincere day. question. Why no, wouldn't, I understand. If it's your Christian duty, why wouldn't you pay for it? Well, the, tr the truth of the matter is, is that we do pay for it in a no, lot of ways. No, actually, the truth is you don't. Christ Catholic, the Catholic bishops, a huge part of this budget comes from taxpayers, and the cost of refugee resettlement and the ancillary costs, education, health care, housing, food, are borne almost entirely by taxpayers. And mm -hmm. so my question is, if you're doing it, if it's a good work, why wouldn't you pay for it? Well, we're going around in circles here. Because, no, but it's, you haven't answered the I mean, question. Part of, it, part of it is a responsibility the government has undertaken as part of our foreign policy to show humanitarian leadership to, to refugee situations around the world, which I think is in our foreign policy interest. And you can ask Brett Scrocroft and other experts who will say the same thing. Can you thing. name one specific benefit, specific benefit the U.S. has derived from settling refugees, specifically, not just they like us more, we show leadership, but like what specifically have we gotten out of it? I think we've increased security in nations throughout the world. If you they become destabilized when you have too many refugees uh, in, a, in a certain country or name, a certain name area. Name one country that's become much more stable because we've allowed its refugees to move here and paid for their resettlement. I'll say, I'll talk about countries that have not become unstable because we've helped them. I'm just asking for one, one Lebanon, tangible, just Lebanon, one, example, one tangible which has benefit. 1.5 million Syrian refugees in their country, right? right? And we've helped them with foreign assistance to maintain those refugees so that they don't go into no, political no. downs. Okay, but you, you, That's in the you're, interest you're of the United States. Different. I'm saying how many countries can you name, or how about one, whose refugees we have taken into our borders, mm -hmm. and it's made that country more stable and us more safe? Just name one. I would say, I would say Syria is one of them. S Syria is in pretty good shape Turkey. now. Turkey. Turkey. We've taken a lot of Turks. We've, no, we've taken Syrians from Turkey, for example. Huh. That's all, all part of helping Turkey keep their borders open so that people can flee and have their lives saved. Huh. Turkey seems in rough shape, but the debate continues. Well, okay. Kevin, thanks for joining us. Okay, thank Appreciate you. It.